Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. My name is Rick Waters, and I am president at Enable Wellness Incorporated and a member of ULI's Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee. On behalf of ULI, I am pleased to welcome you to our today's session, Barrier City, Rethinking Inclusive Environments in City Building. This is the first inclusive built environment focused program from for uh, ULI and uh, we are committed to continue doing more thought leadership in this space. Unfortunately, our sign language interpreter is not able to join us for this session. We will provide enclosed interpretation in the webinar recording. We, all, we apologize for any uh, inconvenience that this causes. As a Toronto region-based organization, uh, we acknowledge the land we are meeting on virtually is the tradition, uh, traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of Credit, uh, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, sorry if I mispronounced there, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land and by doing so, giving our respect to its first inhabitants. To better understand the meaning uh, behind the land acknowledgement, I recommend uh, two programs that we hosted with Shared Path over the last few months, 13,000 years of Indigenous history in the, in the GTA uh, and why it matters to planning and development. And the other is whose land and whose law, Indigenous land. Rick, you're on mute. Sorry about that, I think I cut out there for a minute. Um, we are grateful to the, uh, have the opportunity to work on this land and by doing so, give our respect to its first inhabitants. To better understand, uh, I think I may have covered this, but if I got cut off, to better understand the meaning behind the land acknowledgement, I recommend two programs that we hosted with Shared Path over the last few months, 13,000 years of indigenous history in the GTA and uh, why it matters to planning and development and whose land and whose law, indigenous land rights, examining the duty to consult and accommodate. The link for which will be posted in the chat. So uh, just to get uh, started, uh, many of you will be familiar with these items, but for those who are new to the ULI, uh, I would like to go through a few housekeeping items before we begin. Um, everyone will be automatically on mute. Uh, closed captioning is available for this session. To turn it on, please select the closed captioning button on the bottom of your screen and click show subtitles. There may be slight delay and, and uh, might not be 100% accurate, so please be patient and bear with us. Uh, the, uh, there will be a, a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Please be sure to submit your questions via Q&A function on the bottom of the screen. There's a thumbs up or like button in the Q&A that allows you to upvote a question you would like to have answered. We will give priority to questions with the most votes. This session is being recorded and will be sent to registrants in the coming days and will be made available on ULI's Knowledge Finder platform in the next few weeks. If you want to take uh, the conversation online, please tag us with the handle at ULI Toronto or by using 
Hashtag ask great questions. Today's event and all other ULI programming would not be possible without the sponsor support of our annual sponsors. I would like to say a major thank you to all of them for their support. ULI Toronto relies on the support of our sponsors who allow us to put on the quality programming we do to drive our mission of creating and, uh, and sustaining thriving communities to allow them we are to to all of them we say a heartfelt thank you i would like to thank brookfield and ellis don who is the annual uh, sponsor for equity diversity and inclusion committee we thank them for their continued support of our committee's activity throughout the year it is now my pleasure to introduce the overview presenter and moderator for today's session, Laureen Cazier, Associate Accessibility and Wellness Specialist, Human Space. Laureen will provide an overview of the common isms, phobias, and biases around accessibility and how it affects our built environment. After the presentation, Laureen will dive straight into discussion with our panelists. Lorraine, I'll be back at around 12.40 p.m. to help with uh, the uh, audience Q&A. For now, I'll pass it on to you uh, to do an overview and to get the conversation going. Thanks, Rick. Hi, everyone. So my name is Lorraine Kazi. And I'm so excited to be here with you today. Um, we have such great topics that we'd like to talk to you about. And this panelist that we've come together, hopefully, um, I'm sure they'll come up with a handful of ideas that perhaps we've never considered before. Before I begin, I'd just like to issue a warning that I have included some historical images that may cause some people to be sensitive to. So a general uh, viewer discretion is advised. But really, I'm here to talk about inclusion by design. In today's context, as we listen, learn, and work to do better, we understand that inclusive environments can be represented in many ways. Today, I'm hoping to spark your thought around some critical design choices that impact our ability to create inclusive and accessible spaces. So there I am. So maybe we should start with this. We all have the power and responsibility to create inclusive and accessible environments. So what does it mean to create inclusive environments? The Canadian Center for Diversity and Inclusion, uh, CCDI, identifies diversity and inclusion about capturing the uniqueness of the individual creating an environment that values and respects individuals for their talents, skills, and abilities to benefit of the collective. Or perhaps in more plain language, as divine, defined by Merriam-Webster, inclusion is the act of including or the state of being included. So when we think about design choices, let's take a step back and understand what um, has happened in the past and how it's how it is a reflection of um, maybe what we had thought at that point in time. Throughout history, we have been making design choices that have intentionally excluded people from fulfilling engaging with the space, fulfilling en engaging with the spaces that we live, work, and play. Some of these choices have been explicit signs of hostility, and others have been inverted, host hostile, inadvertently hostile. But in the end, the outcomes have been the same for those who experience the negative implications of such design choices. That of one being not welcome and not belonging and ultimately being excluded. The decision to provide two separate water fountains where one looks more robust to the left and the other on the, the right uh, less robust um, was a means to segregate those who could or could not use the water fountain based on race. 
perhaps racism, actually racism in design. Choices we make about the type of washrooms we provide in our built spaces can demonstrate our values and who, and who have we designed for. Historically, washrooms have been assigned by gender, leaving trans and gender diverse people without a safe washroom space. Regardless of gender identity or presentation, trans and gender diverse people can use the gender fluid toilet, wash their hands and check the mirror. The implementation of these washrooms have shown to decrease anxiety and fear for trans and gender diverse people while using these facilities as there's less chance of physical or verbal harassment or, and assault, which is a real ongoing risk in gender segregated washrooms. Without the provision of all gendered washrooms, we create unnecessary risk for trans and diverse people. Often I hear from organizations, the hesitation, the hesitation to produce provide uh, all gendered spaces range from um, varying levels of fear of one's safety from the opposite sex to simply a fear of trans people. Without the provision of all gendered or gender fluid spaces, we continue to signal that gender and trans gender diverse people do not have a place within our buildings and organizations. This is what I like to call or think about as transphobia in design. Many of our grand historical monuments feature exuberant elements such as, such as grand staircase, signaling the welcoming to a grand space. However, without the presence of an at grade entry or an accessible ramp, these buildings are not welcoming to persons who aren't able to use the stairs. Ableism. No. Ableism is a discrimination or prejudice against individuals with disability. Ableism is a discrimination um, and based on a belief system um, that typical abilities that people may have are superior. Without recognizing the idea of ableism, how can, how can we begin to proactively work towards creating accessible environments? Isms, obias, and bias. So with all of this percolating in the back of your minds, I'd like to touch on some common isms and obias. I will not claim to be an expert in the area, but really have given it some thought over the last year or so to understand how this affects our design and design choices we make. There are a range of isms and obias, and some of you may be very familiar with them. I've highlighted a few that impact our ability to be truly inclusive and celebrate our diversity. Isms range from harmful beliefs and behaviors or institutional practices by groups of persons uh, with power directed against specific groups, uh, where obias you know, uh, can be thought of as a learned dislike, aversion or extreme, rational fear or hatred of group of people. So things like racism, sexism, heterosexism, ageism, xenophobia, transphobia, ableism are some of the common things I observe in my day-to-day -day practice as an accessibility consultant. Bias, a cause to feel or show inclination or prejudice or against or someone or something. Without the acknowledgement of these isms and obias, we can't begin to address how they, have, how they may have influenced the design of our built environment. So I just would like to take a moment to shut sidestep and just explore the relationship between inclusion and accessible design. Designing for inclusion has a broad perspective and even can include different design methodologies such as inclusive design processes. I'd like to note and clarify that designing for inclusion is much broader than accessible design. Though at times inclusive and accessible design have commonly been considered synonymous I'd like to be clear that accessible design is a set of specific strategies that apply to the inclusion of persons with disabilities in the processes and the design of the built environment. As some of you may know on this call, elements that guide accessible design can range from anything from the minimum requirements in legislation, better practices such as uh, municipal standards, national standards, and uh, ongoing research that happens at post-secondary institutions, frameworks uh, like the principles of universal design, the goals of universal design and an inclusive design process, 
to, to, to including persons with disabilities as part of the process. Understanding from the lived experience, the engagement, and the idea that um, nothing for us without us is something that we must continue to do and think about as we move through the design process of our built environment. So when we think about disability, we'd like to think of it from a whole perspective of the range of abilities we have as people. Too often the mistake or a common thing that happens is people think around accessibility of designing for people using mobility devices. But in fact, it's much broader than that. We like to think about hearing, uh, implications for people with limited strength and dexterity, what it means to design for persons who are blind or have low vision, invisible disabilities, cognitive disabilities, and short stature. So I'm just gonna take a few moments to just share some examples of accessible design strategies um, that we've implemented in a range of products, projects, excuse me. Envision as a dramatic change from the conventional, barrier-free suite accessible elements are seamlessly integrated and that can easily be missed within this universal design hotel suite. We considered spatial requirements, multifunctional details with audible and visual elements along with luxurious period finishes that elevate the guest experience. Open closets, lower, lower, um, lowered, um, lower drawers and pulls, um, accessible uh, knee spaces at desks, auto visual elements such as uh, doorbells and then alert systems that are coordinated with the cove lighting system to indicate that someone may be at the door or uh, a fire alarm may have been pulled. By fitting out the bathroom with a sliding door rather than a swing door, we were able to maximize the clear turning floor space. And the idea here was to really uh, think about accessibility being seamlessly integrated into the hotel suite. Another project um, is Access Condos, a condo development that was designed as a tower community to be brought to market while specifically addressing the accessible housing need in the Durham region. It's envisioned as a vibrant new community that seamlessly integrates design strategies for people living with cognitive and physical disabilities, young families, and those aging in place. Applying good sustainable and designing access, sustainable and accessible design practices were also quite essential. Within the project, 100% of the suites meet the barrier fee requirements in the Ontario Building Code, and 15% of the suites were designed to a higher standard. While through various co-design sessions, we established what it meant for a higher um, degree of accessible living. Some of the uh, things that we've incorporated, aside from spatial requirements um, for people using mobility devices or for people to communicate using sign language, was a strategic use of color and tactile features, sensory gardens and outdoor animal relief areas, color and lighting schemes to support visual wayfinding and uh, placemaking, and consideration for acoustical properties and lighting control to help with sensory management. Lastly, I'd like to share a concept project with you called Neighborhood Nest, where we recognize that the strength in building resilient, cohesive communities must consider accessible design. In Toronto, we have a great existing social infrastructure of public amenities, such as libraries and recreation centers. But think of how much more resilient our network would be if we could add even more opportunities for making connections with a finer grained layer of readily available and accessible social gathering spaces throughout neighborhoods. We believe that there's a real opportunity to create these neighborhood gathering spaces by reimagining the internal private amenity spaces that we already provide in new housing, places to foster social bonds that make resilient neighborhoods. Three key physical characteristics uh, include providing options um, for the, along the public realm to offer invitations to pause or take a break, seating that includes basic accessibility features, uh, elements like bicycle parking and movable furniture as well as canopy, providing opportunities to stay with a generous variety of places to sit, lounge and interact, to quiet nooks, flex flexible and accessible furnishings and all types of range of seating options. Places to return, like providing beverages, coffee time as a natural recurring social event. 
but also providing opportunities for community events such as a farmer's market or book club. A case study concept was really about fostering community resilience within multifamily buildings. The accessibility strategies can be easily missed as they've been carefully considered and integrated to the design. In the background, we integrated a robust network of hard infrastructure. The place itself is designed with accessible design strategies, along with passive house design, as well as high performance and window walls. In addition, some decisions made were around providing a canopy for passive house shading, a robust communications network, emergency power and air conditioning, as well as a system for enhanced air quality, refrigeration for medical supplies and other essentials, and continuous water backup. Together, these things, what we like to call the social infrastructure along with the, with the hard infrastructure, create support systems. These rich and resilient communities um, create a network of resources that help us to respond to stressors that can be brought on by extreme weather or unforeseen crises. Building strong neighborhood connections with intentional hard and social infrastructure places where all members of the community are welcome to. When thinking about emergency crisis situations, in many instances, emergency centers, shelters, or quick response environments are not designed to be accessible. In cases where there are power outages and elevator, elevators are out of order or emergency backup services are not provided, often persons with disabilities are disproportionately and negatively affected. The development of something like a neighborhood nest is a typical, is a, a take to a typical amenity space in a condo development that can act as a key piece of supporting a connected and resilient neighborhood. So if there are three messages I could leave you with, it would be that accessible design supports an inclusive experience. Effective accessible design includes people with disabilities into the design process. And lastly, where I'd like to leave off and, and launch into our um, panel is are you willing to take ownership and responsibility how can we commit to making more inclusive and accessible environments through the decisions we make um, in the built environment? Thanks, Denise. So I'd like to welcome our panelists. Um, Danielle Feidler, Senior Vice President and Brand Experience at Tridel. Brad McCannell, Vice President Access and Inclusion at Rick Hansen Foundation. Amy Poitier, Associate and Inclusive the Inclusivity Building Code Strategist at Gensler. And Maya Ziv, Founder and CEO of Access Now and Photographer. Welcome everyone. Hello. <laughs> okay, so, you know, we had the chance to meet and connect prior, prior uh, to the session, and we talked about a handful of questions about what would be important for us to, to talk about during this session. And I think one question that came up um, was, what does it mean to have an accessible environment? Amy, as, a, as an interior designer and someone who's been practicing in the um, environment of, in the area of accessible design, what does that mean? mean to you? Uh, ultimately, I think that an accessible environment means that the built environment would not contribute to a person being able to unaccess, to not access the goods and services that are provided. So it's, it's more of a what can you do versus what can't you do? And is the built environment, what was designed in place, contributing to that? Thanks. So Mayan, how does that compare to, to work that you've been doing with Access Now? Well, I think for us, you know, so, so I've grown up with my disability. I've used a wheelchair throughout my life. And one of the, and I find that so interesting that I, I say that now when I'm on the Zoom calls because you don't always know. Um, but I think, you know, for me, one of the biggest uh, experiences of frustration has always been, um, feeling less valued 
just by showing up at a place that wasn't actually accessible for me. And so what we did with the platform at Access Now was create a, a space where people could vocalize those concerns and share their own experiences and, and together determine, you know, what makes a great space, what makes an, in, an inclusive or an accessible experience. Uh, and, and that's really the approach we've taken. That's great. Danielle, you spoke a little bit about iconography in, in yeah, some of the work yeah. that you've been doing through Tridel. Yeah, uh, building a bit upon what Mayan just said, and I really love that uh, concept because you said, you know, virtual world, you can't see the difference. I think that's so uh, clever. I would say, you know, for many years, we tended to think of this um, solution as a physical one. And Mayan just made that analogy of a bit of there's a social and emotional component. And when we look at accessible, it's um, from a Tridel's point of view. Um, it's, you know, we want our communities to reflect the beautiful diversity of our city. And I think um, when you consider um, in a world where we think there's so much ability to connect through digital technology, we have more social isolation than ever. And so when we are looking at the um, sort of accessible um, housing solutions, it's to look at the entire uh, picture to the best of our ability, but also recognizing that what works for one doesn't work for another. So you mentioned the iconography concept that we were talking about, and it was, you know, just literally, um, we have been working with uh, Luke Anderson from Stopgap, for those of you who may have worked with uh, his group before, and it was something as simple as just the emotional consequence of having the traditional, um, you know, uh, uh, person in a wheelchair or an assistive device represented by, you know, the straight up person as rigid versus the active. And I think anyone in this space, this has probably been something you've been, you know, readily exposed to. But when we drilled it down to a range of things um, that create, you know, whether it's the symbols, the height of our, um, uh, and the types of our signage wayfinding in a condominium community, um, it started really, you know, going down a deeper path of, of design and the whys and the whys nots. Like, if it can exist in a hotel, why can't it exist in a residential housing environment? And so, sorry, I know I digress, but the idea of accessible environment is truly to draw from, I think, the current discrimination language um, or anti-racism, it either all the way is anti-barrier or it is a barrier. And there is no in-between. You either have your policy and designs intent on creating an anti-barrier or barrier-free environment, and that's to be inclusive of everyone. Great. Thanks, Danielle. Um, another question we talked about as a group is, what are we missing in the narrative when we speak about persons with disabilities? I know Brad and Mayanne had a handful of topics that they they brought up. Who'd like to go first? Oh, Brad, you're on. Brad, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, okay, so please release me. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, we, we could all talk about this all day long, I'm certain. But the, the big thing that I think gets missed out there is that just the concept that uh, it's somebody else, that disability happens to somebody else. And, and I would argue that it doesn't matter if you are a teenager and you do a face plant at skiing and you end up in a wheelchair as a quadriplegic or you're 95 and you need a, a walker, you are going to have a disability. The only question is when and for how long. So it's, it's not about somebody else. It's, it's everyone. It's everyone everywhere. And so this idea that it's for a few wheelchair guys, that even that focus on wheelchair users, I mean, it may seem odd coming from a wheelchair user, but geez. Yeah, we've dominated the codes, we've dominated the regulations. When you ask a person on the street about disability, the first thing that pops in their head is a wheelchair. You know, the international symbol for people with disabilities is a wheelchair, but wheelchair users are less than 30% of the population of the community of people with disabilities. So this focus on wheelchairs is really inappropriate. Thanks for sharing those stats, Brad. Mayan? Yeah, I, I definitely would, would echo what Brad said. And, and I think also it's, we, we think of, we think of people with disabilities as this otherness, this other category. And for me, yeah. what, you know, would be the change that I'm really hoping to see and, and that kind of transformational moment is where we involve that narrative 
of disability into how we do everything, <laughs> how we design spaces, how we write, uh, you know, whether it be a news article or a film or how we create a lesson plan uh, for someone or, or how we serve dinner. Uh, it could literally be anything that we do in our lives. Uh, I think that when we understand, you know, Lorraine, as you so um, elegantly put it, when we understand elements of accessibility and inclusive design, we understand that those are often inspired by and for people with disabilities first. And by creating that narrative as something that weaves into the culture of how we do you know, what we do, how we work, how we live, how we play, the, it's no longer an issue of have we consulted with the disability community for this one thing in this checkbox, or, you know, have we, have we made sure that we're compliant, but rather about weaving that narrative through everything we do. Uh, and, then, and then we don't have to actually think about it so much because it's, it's present in how we understand uh, our relationships to each other and, and the world around us. And for me, that's, you know, it, it's very kind of philosophical on a level, but it, it, it's, I don't want to constantly feel like people who work within this space have the, the job of chasing every moment that something is created to convince or advocate or articulate the need for access, the need to be inclusive. I want for people to show up and have that baked into their thinking. And I think that that's the narrative uh, that we are, are so greatly missing today. Thanks so much, Mayan. I don't know if you noticed, but everyone on this call is shaking their heads. So I hope everyone in the audience is also shaking their heads. Yeah, that baking into the narrative is, is, is so the understanding. And I think Amy, you shared a very nice quote last week about, um, I don't, I don't know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I, I talked about, <laughs> I talked about, you know, um, in the future, like the future for accessible design means that I don't have a job <laughs> because it's, 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 it's something that's well understood and, and uh, doesn't need any further explanation. But. Yes. Yeah, I would, I would absolutely agree. And I think just to kind of add to, I, I think that Brad and my end definitely you know, hit the nail on the head with this one. But I think just to just to reiterate too, from a design perspective, I think we just really need to understand that disability does not always need to be visible and permanent. Mm -hmm. So everybody's going to have a different time that they're going to need something different in the built environment. And if we kind of like take that back on our own and start thinking about more adaptable, flexible spaces, and this is particularly important when we're talking about infrastructure that's going to be around for years and, and even decades, right? Like we're, we are building barriers now that people are going to be complaining about in 20 years, 50 years, like let's stop doing that. And I think that that's kind of what we were talking about, Lorene, is that, you know, we don't want to keep harping on the same conversation um, and like talking about iconic buildings all with the grand staircase. Um, you know, like we don't do that anymore, except for there's been a few, I won't name names, but let's really start to push the boundaries of how, you know, how we design for the future so that nobody is complaining about the same things that we have to complain about now. Yeah, well said, Amy. That's, that's great. Do you mind if I add to what Amy was referring to? Yeah, please go ahead. Because, and I'm going to tie a bit about, about both Maya and, and Amy. Um, you know, it begs the question, if design is a reflection of our intention, like what was our intention all these years? Um, Maya, and you said it'd be refreshing to not have to be able to be fighting, you know, to be able to say, you know, uh, make it easy for me to access. Like, why, why would we be designing this way? And what's driven that iconic design, you know, to represent that staircase and, and really be thinking again, our social values and some of the things that went into it. I find, um, I was sharing with you, Lorraine, and I absolutely love the designs you are taking us through, like what you've done with um, uh, that Pickering uh, Liberty Hamlet, that access community. Because to me, it was representing, you know, you have the diversity of tall, t tall you know, high tables, the lower tables, 
Um, it was something for everyone. Um, and it's just thoughtful intended design to be able to um, go after the ranges of abilities um, that people have, whether it's visual. Um, some of the places we were getting stuck was really um, around what was working for one, like someone in a chair where, you know, our transitions to the floors were smooth, was not working for people who were visually, um, you know, having some challenges. So those are really tough things for us, you know, to still kind of get into. But I found um, when I was sharing with you, Lorraine, you said, um, you know, what's missing and uh, from the narrative. And I would argue oftentimes the people themselves. Um, starting off, Brad, I pay tribute to what you said because starting off, um, I think it was almost 20 years ago now, um, there was a couple who was looking for an um, accessible home to live in in Toronto. And there was a five, is it five to eight years still um, for a wait list in Toronto or is it worse? Um, but it was something, you know, really challenging for them. And uh, anyway, we started off on this uh, concept of a condo challenge. And we had this, um, again, this Luke Anderson and, and some of the uh, colleagues that we knew take a challenge and say, you know, in their, um, and it was primarily wheelchair focused, Brad, but we were starting and we didn't know what we didn't know. And from that, we learned that you need to have the consumers at the table with the ranges of different challenges. And then it becomes, I'm gonna say almost simplistic and elegant. They contribute to community led design. So what's missing for the narrative? I'd almost say people themselves, and we have to take a much broader view as opposed to just the uh, special effects that sometimes um, just bring in. Thanks, Danielle. Okay, so the time is flying by. <laughs> Yes, it is. Um, Always. <laughs> it's, it's just flying by. It's like a sign of you're, you're having a good time. So I think I'd like to merge two questions together. Um, the idea of, you know, what is the future? Paint the picture of the future. What would an ideal model we are all building towards? Uh, to, sorry. What would be the ideal model we are all building towards to be an inclusive future? What does a barrier free environment look to you? And what are some Next steps. Anyone want to start? Well, I, I, one of the things that I think in terms of next steps and looking at the big picture and moving forward, I think one of the first things that has to be recognized that access is not a design decision. It's a management decision. Mm -hmm. Management decides the target level of access to be provided. I talk to architects all the time and say, I'd love to do what you want to do, but the owner's not going to go for it. So you have to recognize that this, this is a, a management has to set a target level of accessibility. I, when someone says to you, I want my premise to be more accessible, the very next question has to be to who? To wheelchair users, to people with vision loss, people with hearing loss. They're all different disciplines, all different solutions. And so the step one is for management to recognize this is their responsibility. And what you've been doing up till now is, is, is a code minimum access strategy. So you're just defaulting to code. Mm -hmm. And we know code doesn't make it. It's not even close mm -hmm. to being, you know, providing a real inclusive environment for that matter. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and the other thing I just want to add as a starting point is just to keep in mind that um, access is being able to get into the stadium. Inclusion is being able to play in the game. And so you have to think of it in those big, broad terms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Brad. Yeah, it's um, it's a it's a responsibility that I imagine everyone on on this call and anyone who's joined in are all in positions of of varying levels of power to decide how and um, to what end are we are we creating accessible spaces. Any thoughts from from my Anne or Amy? Um, yeah, I can add. Um, I think um, you know I. I'm at the point now, I think that, and I think there's a bit of precedent for it, not just from the disability community, but really from any marginalized group where I'm kind of feeling like we, one of the most important next steps is, is really for every single person to take responsibility and be accountable. And I think that that's really what Brad's also speaking to is I, you know, we all actually probably come across this in our work where we speak to someone who has the intentions, but for some reason there is a barrier and it's usually another human being or another policy, uh, which is, you know, led by a budget, which someone designed, which somebody put in place, which somebody put red tape around. 
there, there are so many reasons why access is not prioritized because of the complexity of whatever the project may be. And I, I would like to realize a day where people are incentivized and want to be the best at accessibility and inclusive design, where it is a goal and it is a competitive advantage and it is a, a delightful experience to be part of and not something to be feared and not something uh, to avoid. And I think that we have quite a long way to go before we get there. Um, and mm -hmm. most of us are, are there. That's why we work in this space. Uh, but how do we get to the place where every person uh, realizes that they have to do something? They have to do something, they have to act. And I think that that's where uh, recognizing, you know, whether you are uh, a person, whether you run an organization, whether you're representing an entire country, uh, I think every single human person on the planet has a responsibility to contribute to making an accessible and inclusive world for us. And I don't think that uh, the mainstream understands that yet. <laughs> Thanks, Mayan. Mayan, I think that yeah, you, know, you know, according to, to the World Health Organization, yeah. there's, there's oh. over 3 billion of us yeah. out there, or sorry, 1.3 billion people with disabilities in, in the world. That's a bigger market than China. Why are we being marketed Thanks. to? I don't get it. <laughs> Amy, you were going to say something? And then I think yeah, we'll no, I just up. appreciate Mayan's uh, call to action. And I think that the if I could offer any advice to anybody on, you know, what should you do next? What, you know, you feel compelled by Mayan's call to action, which I think we all need as a design professional or somebody that has responsibilities that is going to impact design. Um, start with getting a little bit more feedback about things that you've already done. Mm -hmm. because chances are you probably thought you did something really well that probably is not working. And I don't think we as design professionals do as a good of a job as we should on collecting that data. How is space actually used when we hand it over? What is annoying to the people that are using it? And when we start getting that feedback and data, then we don't keep making the same mistakes over and over again, even with the best of intentions. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just, if you're looking for a starting point, that's going to be my suggestion on that. And then the second one is if you haven't listened or watched um, the, the You Can't Ask That series on CBC, which my Ann was great, graciously part of, um, I think you should. I think you should because there's a lot of people out there that are nervous about asking questions. Um, they're all anonymous questions. They give a lot of great feedback. So CBC you can watch it on CBC Gem. You can't ask that 15 minute segments. Start there, start talking about what hasn't worked in your past design, and then let's have another conversation next year about the next things that we're gonna do. <laughs> or maybe not next year, next week would be fine too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Amy, that's great. That's great, we'll mirror, make sure to- Amy is saying, um, cause part of what that condo challenge we were talking about was, you know, not swallowing the elephant hole and breaking it down into some of the things you can do. And from that condo challenge, that was just a simple exercise and testing how people could get around our common elements and, and in our suites, we learned um, that having simply just slightly more proud elevator buttons, you know, we could pass the closed hand fist, um, opening and closing of doors. You know, I think it's amazing what the Rick Hansen Foundation is doing with the certification similar to lead in our industry. But having said that, there's a lot of spaces to Amy's point in between that you can just get incremental improvements, start and just do some simple tests that can I get in from uh, the outside in? Is there good, you know, visible ways, you know, finding and, and some of the other things. We even said to you, uh, Lorraine, about the height of our concierge desks. You know, we mm -hmm. didn't have to compromise on the aesthetic. We just did two heights. And that allowed right. children as well as a range of people. But I love what you said, Amy. I thought that was great. Thanks, Danielle. All right, so um, I don't know. Rick, do we have any questions or Q&A? Yes, we do, actually. We have um, uh, some great questions. We may only be able to get to a couple of them right now, uh, but uh, let me just pull them up. 
Sorry, I got screens on top of screens here. Okay, so the first question that uh, came up is, how do we get developers to embrace universal design and see the economic positive impacts of design for all? Uh, who would like to tackle that one? I'll take a shot at it. Go for it. Brad McDowell here. Um, uh, we at the Rick Hansen Foundation asked the same question. We wanted to know from a uh, commercial space, retail space uh, perspective, uh, if it was all accessible, what would that, what would the impact be on employment, for example? And so the Conference Board of Canada did a study for us and they revealed two things that were really interesting, well, a hundred things. And, and uh, the first thing was that uh, if the built environment met our minimum standard of 60%, which is above building code, by the way, uh, then what would happen would be that uh, the current rate of un unemployment in people with disabilities is running about 57% of people ready, willing, and able to work. So not 57% of the whole community, but of the people ready, willing, and able to work, 57% of them are either unemployed or underemployed because the built environment is not accessible. And what they did is they put a number on that. We've never had a number on that before. And the number is $16.8 billion to the gross domestic product. Now, if there were $16.8 billion buried out in the roadway, I know we would go dig it up. And if we had to get special equipment to do that, we would invent the equipment. If we had to train people, we would train them, but we would not leave $16.8 billion on the side, especially when access, uh, as Amy was saying earlier, access is really not that difficult. And it's not in the least bit expensive. We have another study with, at the Rick Hansen Foundation done by the HCMA Architecture revealing that at a design stage, there's no cost to creating an accessible environment. And maybe 1% if you go to all the way to Rick Hansen Gold. And so mm -hmm. these studies are both available on our website if you want to look at them. But the implication for employment alone, employment changes everything. If I'm employed and, I'm, uh, and I've got money in my pocket, then I get treated it's the same as everybody else. Because the simple truth is you should want my money as much as you want anybody's money. So getting employment, being part of the market instead of the non-market, you know, being able to buy a house, being able to buy a car, it, it, it's all the difference in the world. So that one thing would change $16.8 billion to the gross domestic product, just that one little thing. Thanks, Brad. Do you mind if I weigh in there too? Is uh, the, I think I'm the developer on the call. <laughs> Um, from Tridel's perspective, I agree um, with Brad, and I'm going to go back to Lorraine. You talked about the um, the opias and isms and the unconscious biases that sort of is in the, um, I, I would say, the psyche of how traditional accessible design has been positioned. And I think there is this concept, Brad, to what you were talking about. It, it, it is equal to something that all of a sudden becomes affordo uh, unaffordable in, in a market that's already hyper-competitive. But now, now dial back if I were paralleling the experience of when we first brought sustainability, uh, sustainability into the marketplace. It was something that, you know, in our local uh, GTA, New York was doing it, but we weren't. And what did it take to get sustainable design in the forefront? It was something like through a option positive based system like LEED, which I think the Hanson Foundation is now pushing. But I think it's also from a consumer point of view, um, you know, I think there's a lot of awareness and lack of education because to um, some of the points that Maya and Amy and Brad have made, you, you think of it as, as something for just a, a single person, but most of us, whether it's knee surgery or you said the kid on a ski hill, will have a temporary need. So the intelligent design is, you know, are you thinking about your resale opportunities? What is, a, as a developer, when I we market our condominiums now, there is real value in the fact that we're lead um, gold or silver. And, and I think that consumers will start cluing into the fact that they have to have like a social score, a tech score, an accessibility score, the, or your home won't resell. Your investment will not do well. So I think we have to start associating, and that's where, you know, pre-call we were talking about the um, ontological, like the connection of all these concepts together to where we reach that tipping point, and it is in demand. And Tridel, we're trying to do it a step at a time. Um, there's, it's been a journey of incrementalism, but I love the call today and working with the panelists because it's excited me to try and do that much more. I just gotta yeah. say though, you know, the, the whole argument around sustainability 
and of course, how, how can you not support sustainability? But the whole concept of, of that occurring in a vacuum, if it's not, a, if it doesn't sustain people too, then it's truly not sustainable. I'm so totally why this, this 100%. Is part of that, I, I, mm -hmm. it just, it's, it's vexing. I shake my head and go, well, how did that happen? <laughs> Well, just even, I think one of the panelists mentioned, or it might have been you, Lorraine, the aging in place. More and more people want to do that. Um, we have a seniors housing division, um, Dell Manor, and there's, I mean, as quickly as we're building them, um, you know, the uh, something that's reasonable and affordable and provides the care that people are looking for. Um, I just yeah. think that it's much smarter to go back to what's our intention in our design. And um, I think it's aligned with what Brad's saying. Thank, Thanks, thank you very Thanks, much, panelists. That, that's uh, some awesome answers we're getting. Um, there's, uh, I think we have time for one more question. We have lots of questions, but uh, one more got voted up to the top, and uh, it's about inclusion related to those experience, ho experiencing homelessness. Um, how do we create inclusive design for these individuals? Do we have an expert in this area on the panel or someone who can answer this question? Inclusion with homelessness. Yeah. And another one that, that's, um, I, I think is uh, interesting that might tie into this as well is um, uh, with, uh, in the times we're in, in uh, with pa the pandemic, um, mm -hmm. how will this influence design and accessibility in the built environment. Um, so mm -hmm. I think there's two um, really pressing social um, uh, social causes or, or social uh, pressures. One is uh, we do have a, a significant homelessness um, uh, uh, incidents in Toronto, so it is um, it it can have a big impact on our community, and also. Um, we are living in some very strange times right now with um, with uh, COVID and uh, uh, everybody in isolation. We've talked a little mm -hmm. bit about um, shared spaces and how will that be affected going forward? So would a panelist be able to touch on that? Brad, okay. Uh, well, if COVID-19 taught us anything at all, it taught us that this idea of warehousing our older adults and seniors in dark buildings at the end of a cul-de-sac with minimum wage support is not a good idea. It's not work. Somebody, uh, somebody called it inhuman, and I, I wouldn't disagree with that. What we have to have is, is, is yeah, more accessible environments, more accessible in community, in, uh, communities so that people can stay in their homes longer. And when they do need special care, when they do need to go into a uh, a long-term care situation it's, it's not a giant bin it's small group home style places in the community keeping the community accessible keeping the elders in the community and, and having that that exchange like, like we warehouse away our, our, our elders and it's just the strangest thing in the world to me because they they built the place and they've got all the knowledge in the world and we're sending them off so it, it just underlines to me how the built environment has to respond to this. It has to be more accessible just to keep people happy and independent in their homes. I think that's great, um, Brad. Thanks. Do we, I know we don't have a lot of time left, but go, if go I ahead, could just maybe add a we could talk um, all day, I know. small <laughs> comment. Um, I think what the pandemic is really forcing us to think about is who who do we value? And that's a hard question to ask. Uh, who who are our communities designed for, mm -hmm. and and who's being left out? Who is not getting the support they need? Who's being neglected? Who's being ignored? Uh, and I think that this time that we're living in has really forced us to look at this and, and not um, not be able to brush it under the rug as as long as we have. And so when you look at who has been most greatly uh, affected by the pandemic, uh, people who are you know, living in insecure housing situations, mm -hmm. people with long-term disabilities, people who are you know, within an aging population, these are the people who've asked for help all along and yet we have put it off and we've put it off and we've, you know, we've designed um, retrofits to support people, but we haven't holistically looked at 
how do we design our systems and our spaces and our communities to support people with different needs? And that actually has nothing to do with disability. It has everything to do with individualism and how mm -hmm. do we support people who have different needs? And so I think that for me is, is one of the greatest lessons of this pandemic. It's we have to move beyond thinking of regular normal people and others. We have to understand that every person has a different experience and you know you think you're secure and then all of a sudden your entire your entire world changes and you have to adjust and work from home and and completely redesign how you live and work and and wait a minute a lot of people with disabilities specifically have been doing this all along so maybe it's a moment to experience and understand empathy and hopefully that can uh, accelerate. And I, I remain optimistic, even though the news tells me otherwise, uh, that, uh, that we can do that, that people can learn and change and, and realize that we do need to do better. I think Winston, what is it? Winston Churchill said, never let a good crisis go to waste. And the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, there's pressures um, and there's some interesting things happening where because people can work virtually, a lot of like the issues in the city and the affordable housing crisis is, again, everybody competing for the same square footage. And it'll be interesting because there is a bit of an exodus, people saying, wait, I can live in Kitchener and still work in Toronto, or I can move to where it can be cheaper. And I don't think that's the answer, um, but it can relieve some pressure where people can have access to work and, you know, a living and, um, you know, through leveraging technology and, and shifting some of the density issues and making hopefully things more affordable. Um, I don't think it's a one, you know, sort of single bullet solution as, as with many things, it's, it's complex. But I do find my, and when you were saying, I'm an internal truth that things are always in flux and there can never be one product or service that's a solution for any um, given person because we all change in the, in, the, in the society, there's all these different groups. There's two really interesting consumer um, convergence. You know, give me exactly what I want, um, this desire for personalization. And another one is this everything as a service, or like, I think they call it metamorphic design. But I think we'll be seeing a lot of that um, in terms of our adaptation and the way we look at things as a result of the pandemic. Thank you very much, uh, panelists. That's, that's uh, excellent uh, discussions. Unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions today, but we will be saving the questions for future uh, webinars. Um, uh, I'd like to uh, move it move along, um, and uh, we um, let's see. Uh, so, uh, thank you everybody for your questions. They're they're excellent, and I now want to pass it over to Brad from the Rick Hansen Foundation to speak about one of their exciting programs. Brad, do you want to take it away? Sure, I recognize there's a real time crunch here, so we'll just blast through some stuff real quick. But one of the, the most important thing about the RHFAC, the Rick Hansen Foundation Accessibility Certification Program, is that the, the effort is to try to create common language and common methodology. Right now, people are using their own checklists, they're using their own definitions and running around. And, and while that, good in a way, as people are looking at the issues, if without common language and common methodology, then it's not measurable across the sector. So if the first thing that the RHFAC does for you is it creates that, that common base. So when, when someone says, what does accessible mean? The RHFAC is the answer to that because it, it identifies what's actually there. It's not, a, we're not the code police, we're not doing, a, it's not a new standard. It's an effort to send a trained professional on site divide the site into eight different areas, and then realistically reveal what is actually there and who it impacts. So that what you end up as an, as an owner at the end of the day is one page. You look at one page, you see your building broke down in eight different categories and you can see where you're weak and where you're strong. And, and the hope is that you'll take that into long-term planning and address the issues in a financially responsible way. So, you know, the, the benefits, you attract more confidence, uh, customers because of the, the sheer ability to be more accessible. You know, there's market differentiation, there's fewer future retrofits, and, and it classes you as a visionary in, in the field. But at, from a community perspective, the real value is that common methodology and common language and, and agreeing for once what disability is on a national scale so that we can address these issues moving forward. 
and recognize that disability isn't one thing, or sorry, accessibility isn't one thing, it's everything. It's all the connected issues. We've been playing a game of whack-a-mole as an industry for eight years now, and some of the other panelists referred to this, where we run from the, you know, they're building a new library. Oh, okay, let's go make that accessible. Oh, now they're building a new pool. Well, let's run over there. And every time we're selling the same can of oil, we're convincing people why they need it. And in the meanwhile, we've created these islands of access and none of the connected issues have been addressed. With, addressed. End of the day, we have to change the design culture. They have to understand these issues as well as they understand sustainability. And so the other thing the RHSAC does is create the training they need as part of normal professional development and to, uh, to bring, you know, when you look at what the, the, the Green Building Council did, you know, they took sustainability from an academic discussion in the 70s to normal design building process in the new millennium. And they did that by changing culture. They did that by professional development, having lead specialists virtually in virtually every firm. It was a simple thing to do. They took the course. So that's the second thing the RHSAC brings to the party. And the third thing is the professionalization of the delivery of accessible design. So the industry has people they can count on, trained people recognized by a third party as expert, not experts in accessibility, experts in using the tool. The tool is what the expert is. The tool has been vetted by the, all the major organizations of and for people with disabilities. The tool has been vetted by a technical committee and by an advisory committee. And it's gone, it's gone through more uh, examination than any code anywhere. So it's current. Right now we have a complimentary rating program going on in Ontario and there's 250 complimentary ratings to be awarded to the public and you can see on the screen the areas we're looking at. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the clock and I, I'm saying I'm looking at Rick and I got to go. But the bottom line is the RHSAC is, is a disability lens that will fit over virtually any project and it'll bring you up to speed on a cross disability basis. We're not wheelchair focused at all, at all. So it's a real opportunity to first identify what's on your site and to move forward in a, in a financially responsible way. We can do uh, uh, assessments of uh, pre-built, so we can, we can do it off drawings, or we can do retrofits and things that work like that. Get a rating. Come on, Ontario, step up. Awesome. Thank you, Brad, for all the information of uh, these fantastic programs. Um, I apologize for, to everyone for going a little bit over the, our time. Um, on behalf of uh, ULI Toronto, I want to thank Lorene uh, for leading today's conversation and to Danielle, Brad, Amy, and Mayan for your uh, participation in today's uh, session. Uh, the, uh, I, I found it incredibly interesting and I hope the conversation will continue. Uh, thank you to our sponsors, members, and guests for turning in uh, for tuning into today's session. We hope you are all keeping well, and we look forward to having you on future webinars. Uh, thank you all, and enjoy the rest of the day.